A. Smith Show starts right now. Welcome to the latest edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show, coming at you as I love to do every weekday over the airwaves of ESPN Radio and ESPN News, 250 plus markets across the United States of America, plus ESPN Radio on Sirius XM, Channel 80, plus ESPN Radio simulcast over the live national television airwaves of ESPN News. Number to call up as always is 888-SAY-ESPN. That's 888-729-3776. The Stephen A. Smith Show is being brought to you by mycomputercareer.edu. Training for a better life. Lots of stuff to get into, stuff percolating out of the City of Angels, Los Angeles, California. They've got a new head coach. We'll be talking about that. Of course, there's been a couple of epic Game 7s. Damian Lillard, C.J. McCollum, and the Portland Trail Blazers knocking off the Denver Nuggets uh, in Game 7 in the Mile High City yesterday afternoon. And then, of course, last night in the nation of Canada, Led by Kawhi Leonard's 41 points and buzzer winning, buzzer beating, game winning, game seven, two point shot from the right baseline over Joel Embiid. The Toronto Raptors are going to the Eastern Conference Finals courtesy of a 92 to 90 victory over the Philadelphia 76ers in game seven of the Eastern Conference semifinals last night in Toronto, Canada. We will definitely get into that in just a second. Obviously, Houston, Golden State, Game 6. Golden State, without Kevin Durant, takes out CP3, James Harden, and the Houston Rockets. We'll get into that in just a couple of minutes. First order of business is this game with the Raptors against the Philadelphia 76ers. We look at the Raptors and we look at Kawhi Leonard. 41 points, 16 to 39 shooting. Ladies and gentlemen, he only, fought, he only shot 41% from the field last night. Shot two or nine from three-point range. That's 22%. That's far lower than what he's been shooting throughout this series. But he was a monster all series long, averaging over 33, averaging better than 50% shooting, averaging better than 45% shooting for three-point range. He was an absolute monster. Could Jimmy Butler defend him? No. Could Tobias Harris defend him? No. Could Ben Simmons defend him? No. Could Joel Embiid defend him in the end? No. And without any help, because Siakam didn't have but 11 points. Gasol didn't have but seven. Danny Green didn't have but two. Kyle Lowry didn't have but 10. 17 pivotal points from Serge Ibaka, no doubt. But in the end, when it really, really counted, as you looked at the Toronto Raptors and everybody that came with it, they did not want the ball. They did not want the ball. <clears throat> there was only one person that wanted the ball, and that was Kawhi Leonard. And he got it. And the Philadelphia 76ers did little to nothing to be able to stop him. He was an absolute monster when it counted. He showed there's a difference between the creme de la creme and those who just want to be. There's a difference between superstars and everybody else. There's clearly a difference between superstars and stars. James Harden is a star. James Harden is a superstar during the regular season. During the postseason, we got to have a different discussion. But I'll get into that in just a second. I'm going to stay with Toronto and Philadelphia for this reason, and this reason primarily above all else. The Toronto Raptors, right now, when you look at Kawhi Leonard, my God, is there a difference between him and DeMar DeRozan? We can understand why Masai Ujiri, the general manager for the Toronto Raptors, elected to make that trade, knowing that Kawhi Leonard could potentially be and likely be a one-year rental. Stay in Toronto for one year, compete for a title, go for the title, et cetera, et cetera. And then after that, and then after that, turn around and you know something? Lose him. But guess what? It was a risk that you're willing to make. No question. No question about it. 
But I do think there's a legitimate question as to whether or not Kawhi should leave for L.A. Clearly, when he wanted to leave San Antonio, that wasn't about basketball. That was a quality of life decision. He was bored living in San Antonio. Let's call it what it is, y'all. This show is carried in San Antonio. I love the San Antonians out there. I love the River War. Not much else. Nice areas in the suburbs, movie theaters, restaurants, all of that stuff is true. But if you're looking for a little bit of excitement in your life in your 20s, let's just say there are other places, dare I say, more stimulating than San Antonio. Now, Kawhi, we don't know that to be the case because he never says anything. But we have to understand that's what we heard when he was in San Antonio. So if that's what we heard when he was in San Antonio, I can assure you of this. Outside of the weather being cold, he ain't got that problem in Toronto. Oh, there's a whole lot to do in, in Toronto. I, I can promise you that. When we talk about the words gorgeous, mosaic, take it from me. It truly, truly is. Let me move on and transition to the Philadelphia 76ers because that's really where the story is. Toronto's about to go against Milwaukee. The Greek freak against Kawhi Leonard. Two of the top four players on the planet Earth going up against one another right now. That's a lot to discuss. And we will as the show progresses because off the top, I think that Milwaukee wins this series in six games. I don't think Kawhi Leonard has enough help. Which brings into question whether or not it was worth Ujiri losing DeMar DeRozan for a guy, albeit better, considerably so, in Kawhi Leonard. Was it worth it for one year? But that's not either, that's neither here nor there. If you're the Philadelphia 76ers, you got an entirely different dilemma on your hands. First things first, do you keep Coach Brett Brown? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to sit here and advocate to meet you that the man should be fired when he just took them to within one basket of an, a berth to the Eastern Conference Finals. What I will say to you is this, though. People are going to look at Joel and B constantly on the perimeter, not on the block. They're going to question Brett Brown. They're going to look at Ben Simmons and no jump shot and the fact that there's been no visible development whatsoever in that category. They're going to look at Brett Brown. You're going to look at the combination of Tobias Harris and Jimmy Butler and say, we can't keep both. We can only keep one. Which one do you keep? Is it Jimmy Butler? Sure. But if he's asking for max dollars, do you keep him then and lose Tobias Harris? Oh, by the way, does Tobias Harris want to stay there and play alongside Jimmy Butler? These are all issues the Philadelphia 76ers have to address, not to even mention their bench. Not to even mention their bench. But I will tell you this. And I will tell you this right here, right now. When I look at the Philadelphia 76ers, I'm proud of these brothers. And I got to tell you something else, too. I saw Joel and B crying like a baby last night. And there were people that were of this mindset. Because remember, the, 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 the Sixers turned over the ball, had clock violations, basically three of the last four possessions. It was a clumsily run final couple of minutes for the Philadelphia 76ers. But you can credit Toronto's defense in large part for that. And also Brett Brown's insatiable appetite for having Joel Embiid on the perimeter. Not the wisest way to go. Not the wisest route to take. But when I saw Joel Embiid crying, whereas most people would malign him for it, I'm not. I love seeing him. I don't know if it was necessary for Joel Embiid to be crying in a hallway while hugging and kissing his girlfriend. I'm not talking about that part. But damn near crying on the court, practically inconsolable when Mark Casal tried to, you know, pay homage to him. When all of that was going on, I'm here to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm here to tell you something straight up and down. When you look at a guy like Joel Embiid being that affected, I'm telling you right now, if you're a Philadelphia 76ers fan, although it absolutely positively is hurting your soul as we speak, I want to let you know something right here, right now. Joel Embiid and those tears you saw him streaming down his face and that pain you saw sifting through his body like that, it may end up being the best thing that ever happened to you. You see, to me, Joel Embiid, and it's not to disrespect him in any way, but to me, Joel Embiid became a man last night. 
Because let me tell you something right now. Ain't no more airplane flying, joking around, chirping. When you lose a game seven and you lose it in that magnitude with Kawhi Leonard drilling a jumper over you that bounced in and out of the rim and then into the rim. About three or four bounces. Let's count them right here. He goes up, clock one, two, three, four. Four bounces. And then goes into the rim to win the series. To win the series. Let me tell y'all something right now. That's some pain that is not going to leave Joel and B for a very, 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 very long time. And when he comes back on the court next year, and he's playing, he's going to remember every aching moment. And when that happens, ladies and gentlemen, could you imagine a monster, a beast, like Joel and B? and I say that obviously complimentary, could you imagine him even more focused, how he'll be if he's healthy? If I'm the 76ers, I leave this man alone. I make sure, work on his knees, work on his back, get him as close to 100% as you can possibly get him, get him in the best condition of his life, and then unleash him. Because nobody can stop Joel Embiid. Nobody can stop him. And what you're going to see with Joel Embiid is a man on a mission coming back. I think it's going to be to the benefit of, of the Philadelphia 76ers. Make no mistake about it. And I think it is something that would bode very, very well for them moving forward. 888 say ESPN is the number to call. It's 888-729-3776. That's one portion of the Stephen A. Smith show that I wanted to touch on. Here's the other. The Houston Rockets. John, do we have that sound from Tillman Fertitta? The owner for the Houston Rockets, Cat Pastor, do we have that? Talking to my producers here. Because let me tell y'all something right now. The Houston Rockets had a 10-point lead, or rather got outscored by 10 points in the fourth quarter. Mr. Fertitta, the owner for the Houston Rockets, was not playing any games. And I'm here to tell you something. He's justified because let me tell you, when I look at the Houston Rockets, Ladies and gentlemen, it's not just that you lost. It's that you lost game six on your home court. You cannot have Kevin Durant healthy on the court, averaging 33 against you. Clearly one of the prolific offensive juggernauts we've ever seen in this game. Kevin Durant has the Golden State Warriors up 2-0 in this series. Houston, with him on the floor, comes back and ties the series. With Kevin Durant on the floor, the Golden State Warriors go up 20 in game five. With them still on the floor, Houston comes back, takes the lead. And then the man goes down with two minutes and 11 seconds left in the third quarter with the calf injury that looked like an Achilles injury. And somehow over the course of the last 14 minutes, without Kevin Durant, you're the Houston Rockets and you have no answer. You don't put your foot on their throat. And, and, and grind them into the ground and take them out? How do you not do that if you're the Houston Rockets? If you're the team who everybody's been chirping about would have won a championship if CP3 didn't get hurt near the end of game five in last year's Western Conference Finals, how is it that now the CP3 is healthy and James Harden is healthy and you got an extra year on your belt having played together and Eric Gordon is balling and P.J. Tucker's going, giving his contribution. Mike D'Antoni is still your coach, so it's not a good, it's not a new system. How in God's name do you turn around and can't do anything in game five? But that's what happened. And then game six. James Harden drops 35. CP3 has his best game of the series, dropping 27. And somehow, someway, the Kevin Looney's and the Andre Iguodala's and the Quinn Cooks and the Jarebko's of the world and the McKinney's of the world come off the bench to help Golden State overcome a scoreless first half by Steph Curry. They keep you in the game until Steph Curry explodes for 33 points in the second half. 
I could go off about that. But why bother when you have the owner for the Houston Rockets, Mr. Tillman Fertitta, in only his second year or so owning the team to do it for me? Listen to this man speak. Very upset right now. They kicked our ass in our home court. They beat us by 10 points in the fourth quarter. It's unacceptable, okay? We just have to be better. And, and I know that we're going to rise to the occasion, and our time's going to come. You know, James is 30 years old. Michael didn't win his first championship till 30. Hakeem didn't win his first championship till 30. I can promise you we're going to win some championships with James Harden, okay? Because we're not going to sit here. We will go to battle every year. We're going to have a strong offseason, and we're going to do whatever we can do to be a better team, okay? We are not going to sit on our hands. I can promise you that. Hmm. Couple of points to pull from that, ladies and gentlemen. Couple of points to pull from that. Point number one, Tillman Fertitta was wrong about this much. Michael Jordan won his first title at the age of 27. He was 27 years old when he won his first title. Okay? Michael Jordan. That year, 1990-91, he was 27 years of age, played all 82 games, averaged 31 and a half points on 53% shooting from the field. He was Michael Jeffrey Jordan. Okay? His birthday is February 17th, 1963. So when you look at him in the 1990-91 season, when they won their championship, he was 27 years of age. That's number one. Number two, <clears throat> listen to Fatita. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, I got to confess, I love this man. I love this man. I love this man's attitude. He's ticked off. He's not happy. They underachieved. He expected more. They didn't deliver. And he's going to hold people accountable. Now, I don't know what he can do. When you're just in the first year of giving Chris Paul a four-year, $160 million deal that they had to give him. When James Harden is going to get his money, what the hell can you do other than let go of the coach? And listen, I don't know whether he's going to do this or not. I really don't. And I'm not sitting here acting like Mike D'Antoni. Oh, get rid of him. Fire him. That's not what I'm saying. And I'm not saying that Daryl Morey didn't do a good job because we know he's one of the exceptional GMs in this business. What I'm saying is if you listen to the owner, since we're not going to sit on our hands, we're not going to stand still. This is unacceptable. Why? Because you lost on your home court in game six. See, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you a different philosophy. And this is why Stephen A. Smith... I guess why I'm not a president of basketball operations. Listen, because I know I would do a good job. But here's the reason why I'm probably not. See, I'd have a goon on my squad. Let me be very, very clear. Against league rules, I'll openly admit it. I'd have at least one goon on my squad. You know who that goon would be? It would be somebody that would re be ready to punch his teammates in the face during practice if he had to. It's, that's, what it, that's what it would be. That's what it would be. I'm telling you that right now. I think every team needs it. And Houston was the voice. And John, I'll tell you what I tell my producer something right now. Tell my godson, Jonathan, here, right in front of me. Let me tell y'all a little story about me. I played Division II ball. I played at Winston-Salem State for the great big house games, whatever the case may be. Cracked my kneecap in half so I could never really shine or whatever. But earlier in a part of my career, before I cracked my kneecap, tell you a little story, John. I had a teammate. His nickname was Shaq. Tall, relatively skinny dude. Wore goggles, high top. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what's going on? That's how he used to talk, you know? And I got into a game. And an opponent for the opposite team drilled three, three shots in front of my face. Just, 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 just drilled three jumpers in my face. He said, yo, and they called me Saul. That was my nickname in college, Saul. And he said, yeah, yeah, so come here for a second. Come here for a second. Yeah, come in. I'm a bust your living, you know what? Ladies and gentlemen, I played 20 minutes the rest of that game. That man didn't score one basket. I was scared to death that Lance Jones, Shaq, was going to whip my you know what? I'm scared to death because he didn't play one play. He 
Trust me when I'm telling you, he wasn't playing. He wasn't playing. He meant it. He's going to bust my living, you know what? Because damn it, yo, it's not happening. Stop him. Figure it out. You need a goon on every squad. And a lot of times we look at do some rough rider like a PJ Tucker, and we look at a guy who's hard nosed, hardcore, and it's his job to defend whatever. No, no, I'm not talking about that kind of dude where he goes on the court and he's a rough rider. I'm talking about the kind of rough rider that makes you scared to be in a locker room or in practice with them because you're afraid of what they're going to do to you if you don't do your job. I think every team needs that. Remember Ken Bannister with the New York Knicks from back in the day? Remember Anthony Mason when, when, when Pat Riley found him off the scrap heap? God rest his soul. Remember guys like Xavier McDaniel, Maurice Lucas, the Bill Lambert's, the Rick Mahorn's of the crew? Those dudes. Xavier McDaniel, those dudes. Charles Oakley's, those dudes. To me, every team needs one of those guys. Every team. Needs one of those guys. To a lesser degree, certainly not the enforcer that any of those guys are that I just mentioned. To a lesser degree, that's Draymond Green for the Golden State Warriors. Do you really want to not do your job and have Draymond Green as a teammate? Because let me tell you something about Draymond Green. He's a basketball savant. He knows the game. He's smart. You can't sit up there and look at Draymond Green and judge him by scoring. That's not what he does. If that's the case, Rodman would be a scrub bagging groceries instead of a Hall of Famer. It's how you play the game. It's the cerebral approach that you have towards the game because of your understanding about what everybody is supposed to be doing along with yourself. And it's the athleticism and the fire in your belly and the competitive fervor in your belly that enables you to hold other people accountable. Why is Michael Jordan great? The GOAT. Why is Kobe Bryant worthy of being in the conversation? Because, ladies and gentlemen, it wasn't just about them and their ability to put the ball in a hole. It was about the fire in their belly that made them hold you accountable. That made them say, I don't give a damn about your friendship. I don't give a damn if you like me. I don't give a damn if we don't get along. You better do your damn job or else. That was them. As great as they were, Kobe and MJ had a little bit of goon in them. They had a little bit of goon in them. Where's that in Houston? It's non-existent. It's a big reason why they lost. It's a big thing that Fertitta was alluding to. And it's why I believe it's possible. I don't know, but it's possible. Fertitta might make a coaching change. I put nothing past this man. He ain't playing. D'Antoni is not safe right now. This was an incredible loss of a series for him. It was an indictment against whether or not you can win playing his brand of basketball. And you can act like it's an indictment against James Harden too because he's no Steph Curry as we've learned and we got that. But the brother did average nearly 35, shoot nearly 45% from the field and over 30% from three-point range. It's not like he didn't ball. It's not like he sold out. It's not like he did a disappearing act like a couple of years ago against the Spurs. He just wasn't Steph Curry. But what position was James Harden put in to succeed? We don't want to talk about that, do we? Well, guess what? We will. Right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio, ESPN News, 888-ESPN. That's 888-729-3776. That was Straight Talk Wireless, everything for less, only at Walmart. Stick around, don't touch that dial. Your phone calls and more up next as I continue talking about these NBA playoffs and the draft lottery coming up tomorrow night. You're listening live to Stephen A, ESPN Radio, ESPN News. By the way, people, I'm here to tell you about Zelle, a quick and easy way to send and receive money right from your banking app. Not sure what to get someone for their birthday graduation or housewarming? Send them money with Zelle, a truly one-size-fits-all present so they can buy whatever they want. The money goes directly into their bank account, typically within minutes if they are already enrolled with Zelle so they don't have to wait long to spend it on the perfect gift for themselves. Look for Zelle in your banking app or get more info at ZellePay.com. Terms and conditions apply. Please let me know. Because I got love for y'all. 
And I'm not trying to denigrate the sport. It's a sport my daddy grew up loving and taught me. Trust me. I'm not denigrating the sport in any stretch of imagination. If I got one thing that I could eliminate from baseball, it would be intentional walks. You get paid for a reason. You don't get to intentionally walk anybody. Man up. If you're a pitcher and you get paid seven figures, I'm sorry. I don't give a damn if it's Bryce Harper or Stephen A. Smith at the plate. Strike me out or get me out. No intentional walks. And let's not take three minutes to throw a pitch. Let's put a clock on that bad boy. Let's do what we got to do. But I'm telling y'all. It's just something that needed to be said. I had to get it off my chest. I'm just looking at these big numbers. And I'm saying, oh, my God. 400 plus million for Mike Trout, 300 plus million for both Machado and Bryce Harper. And you seeing the averages, particularly with Harper and Machado. And there's nobody to really market the sport for you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is bad. You can slice it any way you want to. I'm telling you right now, it is not good. It is not good at all. It is not good for the sport. It's bad. And the reason why I bring that up is because juxtapose that to the NBA. Baseball, baseball, as far as I'm concerned, is dying a slow death before our very eyes. The NBA is thriving. The NBA is thriving. We're talking about three game sevens. And the one series that's over, I'm talking about a potential of three game seven. You're already locked in two. I'm, I'm assuming there will be one after tonight with, in Houston. But the one series that's been locked up, you still got storylines of breathing out of that. Pick your poison. The Greek freak in Milwaukee. The Greek freak is taking over. He's taking over. The Greek freak. Giannis Antetokounmpo. Smith Show ESPN Radio recognizes National Military Appreciation Month brought to you by the Naval Federal Credit Union, proudly serving the armed forces, the DOD, veterans, and their families for over 80 years, federally insured by the NCUA. Plus, get triple action protection for optimal engine performance with Shell V-Power Nitro, plus premium gasoline. 888-SAY-ESPN, that's 888-729-3776. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not exaggerating. I'm not exaggerating. Uh, listen, I got teammates that are still in the area. Kevin Edwards, known as Ski. Uh, my boy Mark Turner that lives in Jersey. My man Boris Terrell Battle that men lives in Minnesota. My man Gary Stevens, a.k.a. Spank, Spanky. Phil Hayes. I mean, there's a whole bunch of cats that I went to school with. They were teammates of mine. And they remember Lance Jones, a.k.a. Shaq, probably still living in Charlotte, North Carolina. That's where he's from. I miss you, boy. It's been damn near 30 years since I've seen you, man. I miss you. I still love you, man. Still remember my boy, my teammate from back in the day. I mean, Chuck Swearinger was my teammate. You know, Maurice Edmonds was my teammate, Mo Edmonds. I mean, I mean, I remember all the boys. You know what I'm saying? Toby, the whole crew. But my man Shaq, Lance Jones, 6'8". Better not score another basket on you, dog. Better not score another basket. And he wasn't playing. He wasn't playing. My man Monte, Monte Ross, former coach of Delaware. One of my best friends in the world. They, they tell you, Shaq, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, nah, nah. He better not score one more basket. That's exactly what he said. He wasn't playing. And I was scared. And he ain't score again either. Because I was scared. Every squad needs a goon. Every squad. Metal World Peace. And when he was Ron Artest, you had cats scared of what he was going to do to them in practice. 
Charles Oakley has run up, up to many a dudes and slapped the living hell out of them. He can't. Don't get me started with my man DC, my brother, Derek Coleman. Ross Strickland was a bad brother. Had no punk in him whatsoever. Even though that time he got in that fight with Tracy Murray, his conditioning was highly questionable. But that's a different subject to another day. Gary Howard, if you listen to somewhere, stop laughing. Here's the point. The point that I'm trying to make to you is everybody, every squad needs a goal. Every squad. And the NBA with all of these little soft peddling rules try to dissuade some of that. But I'm talking about the cats that you practice with. I'm talking about a dude that's a goon to his own teammates, if he gotta be. That ain't on camera. Okay? You can get away with some stuff that way. I'm just saying. 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3766. My man Keyshawn Johnson know what I'm talking about. He tried to be hardcore. Keyshawn actually a very nice guy. He'll tell you how he is, but he a lover, not a fighter. He ain't trying to start no trouble with nobody, you know. Don't let Keyshawn fool you. Keyshawn, don't get me wrong. There's no punk in him whatsoever. But Keyshawn, the type of guy, he ain't trying. He going to talk. He a lover, not a fighter. He ain't trying to do that. Happily married man, I won't say that. But he a lover, not a fighter. He ain't trying to do nothing like that. He just ain't going to be a punk. But you need a goon. You need a goon. It's just that simple. Anyway. Back to our regularly scheduled programming. Before I get to the phones, there's some news uh, that I was a part of this week. And after Adrian Wojnarowski, our insider extraordinaire broke the news that the Lakers had hired Frank Vogel as their new coach. Obviously, some of the inside information came my way because that's who I am. I'm the grave digger. What I do. I ain't got time. Yeah, I'm past that time in my career. Not knocking anybody who does it. Adam Schefter, Wojnarowski, those guys are phenomenal, great in every way. Nothing but love for them. My days of trying to be an insider have long passed. I'm hosting shows. I ain't got time for that. Be the first to the story, please. Give me the dirt after why it happened. That's where I excel. Now, here's the deal. Frank Vogel is the new head coach for the Los Angeles Lakers. I'd be shocked if he lasted two years. And my shock has absolutely positively nothing to do with Frank. That's not the reason I'm taking that position. The reason I'm taking that position is because he's not the man the Lakers wanted anyway. Remember, they offered Monty Williams a job before he took it in Phoenix. They offered Ty Lue the job before he passed it up. Both did had a problem with the three-year deal instead of five-year deal being offered, and both had a problem with the fact that the Lakers were trying to pick their coaching staff. Lionel Hollins, Mike Woodson, former coach of the New York Knicks. Last time they won a division title, he was coaching them. And he was a lead assistant under the Doc Rivers for the Clippers. J.B. Bickerstaff, all of these coaches were or were in the process of being interviewed. Frank Vogel wasn't a part of the list, but Frank Vogel snuck himself in there, clearly was willing to take three years at a million less per year than Ty Lue, which saved the Lakers $3 million. Plus, he was like, fine, go ahead and pick my staff. Because nobody was knocking on the door for the coach that used to coach the Indiana Pacers for 10 years and coached them to four consecutive playoff appearances and five times in the last six years in the postseason. Nobody looked at Frank Vogel and was like, let me knock down his door to get him as the head coach. So as a result, he was trying to be back in the mix. I can't hate on him for taking that opportunity. He did the right thing for himself. He got $5 million a year. Guaranteed for at least two or the three years, if I remember correctly. And oh, by the way, if he wins, who knows what may happen. But the bottom line is he's back in the mix and he's coaching LeBron James. So how much are you going to lose if LeBron James is healthy? Ain't going to be that much. But the caveat was that you had to take Jason Kidd as a special assistant coach. Because the Lakers, yes, they wanted Kurt Rambis as your associate head coach and all of that other stuff. But even Kurt Rambis wanted Jason Kidd. Rob Palenka wanted Jason Kidd. Jeannie Buss wanted Jason Kidd. Because Jason Kidd is universally respected for developing young talent because of what they did in Brooklyn and because of what he did in Milwaukee with the Greek freak. He didn't draft Milwaukee. He got, the, he got there the year after. But he's widely credited with developing the Greek freak and Middleton and those boys. Him and his coaching staff. And so because of it, they were looking for them to continue to develop the young players in Kyle Kuzma, Brandon Ingram, Lonzo Ball, and these boys. Caruso, even, because I like him. 
It would have been nice if Zeebok was still there and hadn't gotten traded. But that's a different story for another day. Would have been nice if Julius Randle wasn't let go just over $9 million. But that's a different story for another day. Nevertheless, that's why Jason Kidd is there. And he's there, and he wasn't hired as the head coach, ladies and gentlemen, because op from an optics perspective, the Lakers knew it wouldn't look good. Jason Kidd, former DUI charge, alleged domestic violence situation, reputation, not being satisfied with just head coaching responsibilities, wanting to usurp the authorities of those above him, which doesn't get you hired in NBA circles. But here's how you also know that Jason Kidd is going to be the next head coach of the Los Angeles Lakers quick, fast, and in a hurry. He was still owed about $10 million from the Milwaukee Bucks. $10 million. So you owed that money, ladies and gentlemen. Why would you take less to be an assistant on a bench? Unless there was this wink, wink deal that you'd be the head coach eventually. Frank Vogel took the job to get himself $5 million to get back into the coaching ranks to show what he can do so he can land a job outside of L.A., resurrecting his career. Can't hate on that. Jason Kidd's going to be the next head coach for the Los Angeles Lakers, barring any unforeseen issues that prop up. Jason Kidd's going to be the next head coach of the Los Angeles Lakers, and it's going to be inside of two years. Frank Vogel ain't long for this job. It has nothing to do with him. He's not the one they wanted. He's the one. They were willing to stomach because he was the one willing to put himself in position to accept the circumstances that the Lakers presented to him in order to be the head coach of their franchise. He was a guy, a head coach willing to allow them to pick his staff for him, knowing that they want Jason Kidd. And accept three years instead of five years. And accept five million a year instead of six or seven million per year. See, the Lakers make their money off of the Lakers brand. Ballmer's already worth billions without the Clippers brand. For example, Lakers ain't rich. Lakers make their money based on what, Jeannie Buss makes some money based on what the Lakers make. When it costs the Lakers money to pay somebody something, it costs Jeannie Buss. That ain't, a, that ain't a problem Steve Ballmer has. That is the situation. That is why Frank Vogel is the head coach. That is why Jason Kidd is there, soon to be the head coach of the Los Angeles Lakers within two years. Very, very simple. 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. Back to your calls in a minute. Don't touch that dial. It's Stephen A. Right here on ESPN Radio and ESPN News. By the way, when you're hiring, you don't want to waste time sorting through dozens of irrelevant resumes, do you? You want an efficient way to get to a short list of qualified candidates. That's why you need Indeed. Hell, you mean we just got to make shots. What Mike D'Antoni should have been saying is Stephen A. Smith would have coached the Houston Rockets, and I'm not qualified. I'm not qualified. Now, I know I'd be a hell of a basketball or a president of basketball operations. I have no doubt I would, I would kick tail with that job. But in terms of, because I know who to hire, and I know how to evaluate talent. And I know softies and scrubs when I see them, and they want to be a part of my team. Let me be clear. And yes, unpopular to say, against the rules of today's NBA, I would absolutely positively have a goon on my roster. One goon, just one. I need somebody that's willing to beat teammates up in practice if they slack off. I need somebody that's willing to hurt somebody during games to remind you this is business. This is serious. But getting back to D'Antoni. Dan Tony's in a, in a, in a timeout. Just got to make shots, guys. We just, just got to do our thing. Make shots. What? You supposed to be like this. Kevin Durant's out. Kevin Durant's down. This is our opportunity to put our foot on their neck and grind them into the ground. That's what he was supposed to do. That's what he was supposed to do. That's what CP3 was supposed to do. I don't understand this. I don't understand y'all. We got, I mean, I'm trying to tell you right now, the number one sponsor with some of these fans and some of these people in the NBA should be Cottonelle Tissue, soft as putty. That's the number one sponsor that should be in the NBA with some of the stuff that's going on here. You got Kevin Durant down and out? That's your time to put your foot on your neck and stomp them. And instead, Steph Curry goes off. Klay Thompson hits a three. Draymond Green hits a pivotal three from the left wing. 
and they were the Rough Riders. They were the dogs after Kevin Durant went out. Oh, CP3 and Jay Charlie got to make up for this. They got to make up for this. I know friends and family members of both. They know where I stand. Smith Show on ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance. Guests on the Stephen A. Smith Show appear via the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line. And you can always get in touch with the show through the 1-800-Flowers Twitter feed. Biggie, give me one more chance. Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show. We're coming to you live from above the Heineken River Deck at Pier 17, South Street Seaport. By the way, if you missed my opening segment, go check it out on demand in the Stephen A. Smith Podcast brought to you by Capital One. Capital One is reimagining banking, offering accounts with no fees or minimums that can be opened in five minutes. Capital One. Hey, hey, what's in your wallet? Capital One, NA member, FDIC. A uh, couple of things to report. Uh, Ramona Shelburne, uh, great NBA reporter for us, is reporting that Durant out at least game one, unlikely for game two. Let let me piggyback off of that. That is absolutely correct. He's going to be out the first two games of the series. That's what I was told in Houston just uh, uh, Friday night before game six. Kevin Durant is not expected back before game three. Period. Period. Let's go to the phones. Let's go to Mike. You're live with Stephen A. Talk to me, Mike, real quick. Hey, Stephen A. Thanks for having me on. Long time, first time. Thank you. Go ahead, buddy. Um, I hope your producers will give me a moment. So well, you got to hurry up because we got a hard commercial break. Just get to your point, brother. You got a minute. Go ahead. Yep. Uh, I've been a LeBron fan for a long time, uh, but I wouldn't wish the LeBron James clutch sports circus on any franchise uh, or my worst enemy for that matter. Uh, the Lakers have gone from looking like a team with a bright horizon to a team that botched the AD trade. Rich Paul insulted the Pelicans to the point that they wouldn't deal with them just out of spite. Uh, and then they go on missing the playoffs. The most famous player in their franchise. Let me history, stop you right there. Cuts- let me, let me stop you right there, Mike. Um, I'll come back to you in hour number two, if you want me to, but you sound lost right now. First of all, LeBron James got injured and missed 17 games. Secondly, even though you could talk about them botching the Antonio Davis thing, and that's a legitimate argument, they have nothing to do with Luke Walton being gone. They have nothing to do with Magic Johnson and the Los Angeles Lakers uh, parting ways with one another. Clutch Sports ain't running the show in that regard. Rob Palenka is elevating in power. Linda Rambis and Kurt Rambis are elevating in power because they're in Jeannie Buster's ear. That's probably why Magic Johnson elected to walk away. That has absolutely nothing to do with Clutch Sports. They're not perfect. Nobody, any stretch of the imagination. I understand the critique, but the fact of the matter is, it's not right to blame Clutch Sports for the debacle that is the Lakers. That's all about the Lakers. Hour number two with your calls up next. You could take the treatment of your ulcerative colitis. The Stephen A. Smith Show starts right now.
about the Cleveland Cavaliers. LeBron's not there anymore. Kevin Love should be on his way out. Don't torture that man by keeping him in Cleveland. Send him someplace where he can compete for a championship. He's a damn good player. I mean, you let J.R. Smith out of his misery. When you look at, at the Cleveland Cavaliers, other than Sexton out of Alabama, who the hell else is there? Give a damn about Cleveland. Why are we just so what? John B. Like, congratulations. Bravo. Bravo. It's so touchy. I mean, good, 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 fine. And? I mean, it's a breaking news. I'm like, oh, my God. I said, okay, he's the coach. Okay, that's great. Okay, good breaking news. And then they actually had to do a segment about it. Why? I'm sorry, Cleveland. LeBron's not there anymore. No one cares about you right now. Not about the Cavaliers. care about the Browns. Hell, you care about the Indians. But the Cavaliers? No, no, no. Your day has come and gone. Let's get Zion. And by the way, speaking of Zion, let me be the first to say Ladies and gentlemen, I got to tell you from the bottom of my heart, I am hoping and praying that Zion Williamson ends up in one of two places. New York or L.A. I know my man Will Kane said today Atlanta, and I like him with Trey Young and all that stuff. They play at a fast pace. He's going to be bombing threes. You got Zion Williamson, a monster in the open court and in the post. I get that. The Bulls, yeah, you know, I don't want them there. I don't wish that on them because when you have that level of, of, of athleticism, inevitably people are going to want you to be MJ. There's only one. So when I look at it from that perspective, no, that's not a good thing. Phoenix, I wouldn't wish that on my worst nightmare. I want Devin Booker up out of there. My man James Jones, I'm rooting for him. Good brother. So I shouldn't say all of that because I'm fond of him and I want him to do well. But I mean, Phoenix, is it's like, like, it's like basketball purgatory. I'm sorry, but since Mr. Sarver has taken over and D'Antoni and Steve Nash have been there, they, they, the only thing relevant about uh, the relevant about Phoenix is the is the dust, the desert dust. That's it. Nobody gives a damn about the Phoenix Suns. I mean, we can now because DeAndre Ayton has been associated with that pay for play scandal that's got their coach at Arizona in hot water because he's playing for the Phoenix Suns now. But that's it. Nobody gives, and, and Devin Booker, I mean, when we look at Devin Booker, our heart felt sympathy. We've thought about sending Dr. Phil there. We've thought about sending psychiatrists there. He needs all the help he can get. Damn. They stink. Okay? So nobody cares about the Phoenix Suns. The only thing relevant about them is the dust in the desert. That's right, I said it. The desert. So you think about those cactus trees, and you think about dust, and you think about hard, I mean hot, suffocating heat and weather. That's it. There's nothing else about Arizona that moves you. Nobody think about no damn Phoenix Suns. So we don't want Zion out there. We want him in New York or L.A., and here's why. New York is New York. New York has never had an athletic phenom playing above the rim that was a walking highlight reel. We've never had that. Okay? Walt Clive Frazier, Earl of Pearl Monroe from the 70s, they were skilled players who could really, really ball, but they weren't highlight reels. Patrick Ewan wasn't a highlight reel. Hey, hey, John, who was the, who, who was the dunker? Kenny, Kenny something that was drafted by the Knicks? Damn, I can't remember. I'm just having brain lock right now. Won the slam dunk contest. Kenny Walker out of Kentucky. And he could dunk, but couldn't necessarily play. Mark Jackson was rookie of the year, and it was his flashy passes coming out of St. John's. We love that. We had nobody like Zion Williamson blessing the presence of the garden or the corridors of the garden. We ain't had that. And if Mr. James Dolan could just manage in his court to stay the hell out of the way. Stop being Mr. Paranoid. Stop getting people banned from the garden just because you don't like what they say and all they're doing is asking you to sell a team. Stop reacting to nonsense like that. Stop being a damn juvenile showing that you were born with a, spill, with a silver spoon in your mouth every damn chance you get. Instead, just chill. 
Let Steve Mills and Scott Perry run basketball operations in the garden. Stop interfering. Stop restricting the media. Stop banning people from press conferences and all of this other stuff. Because let me tell you something, Mr. Dolan, New York Knicks. You're wrong to do that. I don't give a damn what your relationship is with the New York Daily News. It's petty. You're a grown damn man. A grown man. Act like it. I mean, damn. Barry Watkins, who's been Dolan's right hand for many years. Barry Watkins. I want to say something as a credit to this man. I like Barry. But I want to give, take a moment to give him incredible, incredible props where it's due. He called me one day years ago. And I'm sure he won't mind me divulging this. That's why I'm doing it. He called me one day years ago. Because they had a very bad relationship with the New York Daily News. The reasons vary. I'm not getting into any of that. It's none of my business. Quite frankly, it's none of y'all business. But here's the reality. Well, maybe let me take that back. It is kind of y'all business, but it's for the Daily News and the Knicks to tell because they're the only ones that truly know the truth about what's going on. We just hear multiple stories. So let them tell it. But Barry Watkins, Dolan's right-hand man, overseeing media relations, public relations, and all of that, who's outlasted Pat Riley, Ernie Grunfeld, Jeff Van Gundy, somehow, someway, Barry Watkins has survived for many years. Barry Watkins said something to me one day. And I so appreciated this. He never sat up there and tried to spin what I said, misconstrue it, nothing like that. All Barry Watkins said, could you do me a favor, please? When you talk about the New York Knicks organization and Madison Square Garden in concert with the New York Daily News, can you please just inform the public? We don't like them. We don't trust them. And we don't believe anybody should listen to anything they say. And they probably feel the same way about us. So can you please just say that before you get into anything about us? And I think that's totally fair. To preface everything that involves those two entities. Highlighting their disdain for each other. And leave it at that. That's all he asked which is why I never go, I, I never fail to go out of my way to make sure I emphasize that because that's all he's ever asked. It's James Dolan himself that takes it to another level. Steve Mills, Scott Perry running the Knicks organization. Who gets in the way? James Dolan. Headlines, Charles Oakley being escorted by security out the arena, forcibly so. James Dolan getting rid of a, of a fan and all the fan did was say, please sell a team. And he making headlines for that kind of nonsense. That's James Dolan. He's getting in the way. And I'm telling you right now, I'm hearing 95% chance KD, Kyrie, both coming to New York. If anything could get in the way, potentially, it's that nonsense. Because it ain't going to be Steve Mills and Scott Perry. Ladies and gentlemen, they're doing their job. They're doing their job. They're working this thing with agents, with players, and everything else. They're working it. They're doing what they're supposed to do as executives hovering over a franchise. Anybody that's going to get in the way is, Dane, is James Dolan's petulance. He'll pull out the money. He's got deep pockets. He'll pay for whatever's necessary. And oh, by the way, he's far more generous than giving credit for. James Dolan has done a lot of good things for a lot of people. Including what he did for Tyler, Tyson Chandler when Tyson Chandler's mother was ill. And James Dolan sent his private jet to pick up Tyson Chandler just to bring him to games and to take him back to his mama when he finished. He wasn't even practicing with the team. James Dolan did that. James Dolan does a lot of good that he has not given credit for. But the reason he isn't giving credit for it is because of his own petulance and belligerence and childishness that gets in the way and glosses over the good that he actually does. So let's just hope that that doesn't get in the way of KD and Kyrie coming to New York. Because I'm hearing there's a 95% chance that they're coming in. Folks are say, well, refuse to say 100% because KD and Kyrie's personalities are of such that they could change their mind at the last minute. But it's pretty much done. And if you get Zion to the garden, 
especially with those two. Lord have mercy. It would be something special to behold. It'd be box office. New York Knicks would be a Final Four team in the Eastern Conference. Tell you that much. They'd get it to at least to the conference semifinals. So they've got a 14% chance. Okay, and we'll see what happens. They're one of three teams with a 14% chance to get the number one overall pick in tomorrow's NBA draft lottery. The Lakers don't have that much of a chance, but they're in the draft lottery. That's another place I'd love to see Zion Williamson. Here is why. Zion. Zion Williamson. With LeBron James, as you can see the odds right there, Knicks, Cavaliers, Phoenix Suns, all with a 14% chance, Bulls with a 12.5% chance, Hawks with a 10.5% chance. If I had to pick two of the teams out of those top odds, it would be the Knicks and the Hawks. But I'm hoping the Lakers will get up in there because I love the idea of Zion with L.A. It would be drama personified. It would be the Lakers brand, the purple and gold, back in the spotlight for some of the right reasons. You know what LeBron can do. And to have a young stud phenom that he could teach the game to while feeding the ball to, while setting up to succeed, which I believe LeBron would do because he's at his best with the ball in his hands, making decisions, I love it. And I would not rule out the possibility of Zion. I mean, I wouldn't say the possibility because the ping pong balls, I have nothing to do with that. But I would tell you, if I preferred them one or two places, it would be that. 888-SAY-ESPN, it's 888-729-3776. Let's get back to these playoff games that took place. Let's get back to all of this stuff. Lakers, coaching job, everything else in between. You're listening live to Stephen A, ESPN Radio, ESPN News. Justin, you're live with Stephen A. Talk to me. Hey, Stephen A, how are you? Thank I'm you for good. taking my call. Go ahead, man. I swear, you were, I swear you were screening the call, man. I totally agree with you, man. I was talking with the guy to answer the phone, and, like, you know, the Houston really misses, like, Patrick Beverly and, like, just having the defensive hard nose presence. You know, they never really had that besides Beverly. But when you said Charles Oakley and Anthony Mason, man, the NBA really misses that, you know. And I'm not, I'm not going to keep running with that because you already talked about it. But I want to know what your opinion You think the Bucs, if they get through, and then, you know, obviously with the Warriors getting through, you think the Bucs can give uh, Golden State a run for their money? And uh, I really hope the Knicks get done, um, man. We've been, are you, are you, been really hurt. For well, a well, 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 stick to one subject at a time, my brother. Let me be very clear. I think the Bucks got a chance to beat the Golden State Warriors. Now, I, I'm not, I now, I'm not I saying, now, I'm not saying I would pick them because if Kevin Durant comes back and he's 100%, I'm certainly not going to doubt Kevin Durant with Steph and Clay. But I'm telling you right now, make no mistake about it. Let me be very, very clear. The Greek freak being as dominant as he can be on the inside and in the open floor, combined with everybody from Middleton to Meritish, uh, Meritish, Meritish to George Hill to, I, I, I mean, Brooke Lopez, you got four to five guys that can shoot the three. And oh, by the way, four of those guys, which included the Greek freak, shot better from three-point range in their series against Boston than Kyrie Irving shot from the field. Ladies and gentlemen, if the Milwaukee Bucks defend the way that they've been defending and hit perimeter shots the way they've been hitting perimeter shots, they can beat the Golden State Warriors. I wouldn't bet my money on it but I will tell you that series is going a minimal of six games. And you have to remember that the Milwaukee Bucks have home court advantage. So if there were to be a game seven, it would be in Milwaukee. Let's keep that in mind. Let's not underestimate what we're seeing here. Give you the last word, Justin. Go ahead. No, I totally agree. They also have the size, and I think also the Bucks can score with them. That's why I asked you if you think they can run with them, especially if Kevin Durant's not healthy. No, no, no. If Kevin Durant is not healthy, the Milwaukee Bucks will beat the Golden State Warriors. If Kevin Durant, for some reason, can't play, they will beat the, – the Milwaukee Bucks will beat the Golden State Warriors. They need Kevin Durant to win the title. They need Kevin Durant to 3 P. They will not win without Kevin Durant. They might not beat Portland without Kevin Durant. I'm just telling you. Appreciate the call. 
Frank, you're live with Stephen A. What's up? How's it going, Steve? I'm good. What's up? Man, I want to talk about Philly a little bit. I'm a BK fan, and I ain't no hater, man. But I'm I'm so happy that Joe B. You know, I'm happy for him, man. I'm happy this happened to him, man. The way he was bullying you know, us like that, and, and and the way he played against us, you know, we knew that we were the team and all Who's that. Who's us? What are you, a Raptors fan? No, I'm a PK fan, man. Brooklyn. Okay, go ahead. So the way you know the way they play, the way they were bullying us, making fun of us. I I, I didn't like the way the way they came out of us, man. So I'm happy that they lost the way they lost, man. Well, Not listen, I, I will tell you this: you should be happy that they lost, unless you're rooting against the Sixers in the future. Because let me tell you something: I think Joel Embiid is going to come back and wreak havoc upon the league next season and beyond. You saw his face yesterday. He was crying on the court. Gasol was interrupted his celebration to go over and hug Joel Embiid and to just con congratulate him on a great series. That's how distraught Joel Embiid was. I mean, to go in the hallway, crying in his girlfriend's arms, all of that stuff, as embarrassing as people want to call that to be. Let me tell you something right now, man. When it hurts you that much, I think it's the best thing that ever happened to Joel and Pete. That chirping, the airplane flying, the cracking of the jokes and all of that other stuff. That man is going to be far more serious in the future, in my estimation. And if that happens, my condolences to the rest of the league if he's healthy. I'm telling you that right now. All right. I mean, I feel you, but what he did to us, man, the way, the way he was making fun of us and bullying us like that, man, I don't feel, I don't feel bad I for him. I got you. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot, man. James, you're live with Stephen A. Talk to me, James. James, are you there? Going once, James. Going twice, James. Goodbye, James. Chris, you're live with Stephen A. What's up? Hey, Stephen A. Good talking to you again. All right, uh, go ahead, man. quick, uh, I'd like to address a couple of things that you said. Uh, number one, uh, Zion to the Lakers. Don't think it's a good fit, Stephen A. Um, with LeBron being there, LeBron obviously ball dominant. Yeah, he'll help him grow, but he uh, won't be able to take a game to the next level, I think. Stop right the there. Here. Stop right there. What would Zion do if there were no LeBron, in your estimation? What, I'm not, what, talking, I'm not even talking about the Lakers. I'm talking about anything. Tell me what he would do without somebody setting him up on the NBA level. He, he wouldn't be effective, but but having somebody set him up and LeBron are two different two different things. Steve. So explain, about, explain, what, ex, ex, explain that point right there to the listeners. You're saying that setting him up and having LeBron James to set him up are two different things. Explain. Absolutely. Well, number one, a, a predominantly floor general, somebody not looking to score. LeBron will needs to score for the Lakers to be effective. Obviously, yes, he's still our best passer and our best playmaker, but he needs to score. To, for the Lakers to be successful. And now if he's playing with a predominantly pass first point guard, of course he will flourish. But I don't think it coincides with what the Lakers are trying to do, with having two, three dominate the basketball, along with having the Kuzma and the Ingram still trying to elevate their game. That's why I think it's a bad fit, Steve. All right, well, that, I got that point. The Kuzma point is a very good point. But here's why I disagree with your point about LeBron being a scorer first. First of all, let's understand something. LeBron averages 27 a game, but LeBron is a deferential passer. He doesn't mind passing the ball. That's number one. Number two, here's the big thing that I think you're missing. The game has changed. It's sped up. There are more offensive possessions. There are more offensive opportunities. And the fact is, this ain't the 90s or the 80s. When you look at the possessions and the opportunities that you have to score, I don't think the presence of LeBron hurt somebody like this. It might hurt Kuzma, who was your secondary offensive option. It might hurt Ingram. But I don't think the Zion Williamson acquisition hurts LeBron. And I don't think LeBron hurts Zion. I think the other guys might get in the way, but not LeBron and Zion of each other. Got you. Okay, well, honestly, Stephen, I don't want to talk about the Lakers. Let's talk about them come summertime. Uh, real quick, I, I want to talk about something you said regarding Brett Brown and Joel and B and Ben Simmons, Stephen A. I actually 1,000% disagree when you said that some of the or a lot of the onuses on Joel and B not playing with his back to the basket and Ben not being able to shoot the ball well enough uh, as an indictment or whatnot on Brett Brown. I disagree with that 1,000% because I think that individually these guys, well, well two things. Number one, uh, Joel Embiid's been playing like this all season. We can't ask him to change the way he's, he's been playing all season. That's the reason why you got there. That's number one. And number two, 
Ben Simmons is, is type of, he's the perfect his craft in the summertime. I don't put that on the coach. Well, if first of all, well, 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 first of all, congratulations, Chris, because you'll never work in the NBA. Let me tell you something right now. When you look at Joel and B, you've had the man for these years. All three years he's played in the NBA, you've been his coach. At some point in time, it wasn't until this year that he developed the post game. I'm sorry, that's coaching. That's co that part is coaching. Get your butt down on the block. I'm not saying to, to eradicate your perimeter shooting ability. I'm saying that your priority at 7'1", 260 plus, being a man child with that agility, those moves, you have to dominate in the post. The reason why they won games two, the reason why they won game three, the reason why they won game six is because they started inside out, not outside in. That's number one. Number two, Ben Simmons, absolutely right. He has responsibility. But guess what? If you're playing with a coach that doesn't hold you accountable and you got and you and coaches are sent to you and you sit up there and you tell them, well, I got about an hour for you where I'll work out or something like that, that's a problem. That's a problem. And yes, it's a problem with Ben Simmons because he's young. But it's a problem when your coach doesn't have enough presence to affect that individual as profoundly as he does. Allen Iverson may not have been somebody that was inclined to listen to Larry Brown. But Larry Brown got on his damn nerves so much because he kept pestering and peppering him. Iverson knew he had to be accountable for someone, whether it was Larry Brown, whether it was the Sixers organization, whether it was the media, because Larry Brown wouldn't let it go because he was harping on the things you were supposed to be doing. That's not what we're hearing from Brett Brown. And that could be problematic. I got to run, Chris. I appreciate the call. 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. Back with more of your calls and then some in a minute. You're listening live to Stephen A. ESPN Radio, ESPN News. By the way, when you're hiring, you don't want to waste time sorting through dozens of irrelevant resumes, do you? You want an efficient way to get to a short list of qualified candidates. That's why you need Indeed.com. Baseball is in trouble. I just want to let you know right now, and Rob Manfred and Major League Baseball, anything that Stephen A. Smith can do to help you, please let me know. Because I got love for y'all. And I'm not trying to denigrate the sport. It's a sport my daddy grew up loving and taught me. Trust me. I'm not denigrating the sport in any stretch of imagination. If I got one thing that I could eliminate from baseball, it would be intentional walks. You get paid for a reason. You don't get to intentionally walk anybody. Man up. If you're a pitcher and you get paid seven figures, I'm sorry. I don't give a damn if it's Bryce Harper or Stephen A. Smith at the plate. Strike me out or get me out. No intentional walks. And let's not take three minutes to throw a pitch. Let's put a clock on that bad boy. Let's do what we got to do. But I'm telling y'all. It's just something that needed to be said. I had to get it off my chest. I'm just looking at these big numbers. And I'm saying, oh, my God. 400 plus million for Mike Trout. 300 plus million for both Machado and Bryce Harper. And you seeing the averages, particularly with Harper and Machado. And there's nobody to really market the sport for you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is bad. You can slice it any way you want to. I'm telling you right now, it is not good. It is not good at all. It is not good for the sport. It's bad. And the reason why I bring that up is because juxtapose that to the NBA. Baseball, baseball, as far as I'm concerned, is dying a slow death before our very eyes. The NBA is thriving. The NBA is thriving. We're talking about three game sevens. And the one series that's over, I'm talking about a potential of three game seven. You're already locked in two. I'm, I'm assuming there will be one after tonight with, in Houston. But the one series that's been locked up, you still got storylines of breathing out of that. Pick your poison. The Greek freak in Milwaukee. The Greek freak is taking over. He's taking over. The Greek freak. Giannis Antetokounmpo. Stephen A. Smith. 
only at Progressive.com. Plus, you know what never goes out of style? Surprising a friend or loved one with buy one, get one free multicolored rose bouquets for $29.99 from 1-800-Flowers.com. To order, go to 1-800-Flowers.com slash ESPN. Back to the phones we go at 888-SAY-ESPN. Oh, by the way, before I do, I want to play some sound about the Knicks and free agency from GM Scott Perry. He was on this morning on ESPN Radio with Mr. Golick and Mr. Wingo. Here's what the GM for the New York Knicks had to say. Obviously, we just want to try to get our team better. We're looking to add some talented players that, that fit into our culture, guys who are committed to, to building a championship contender in, in New York. You know, competitive guys who understand what it takes to win at, at, you know, at this level. You know, we have a good young core of players, but we feel that we're going to need to add some veteran players who have kind of been through the, the wars, if you will, who uh, understand the winning like we talked about. And we just feel really good about the direction that we headed. And we just want uh, guys who feel strongly about that, who see that vision along with, side with us, and who want to come here and help uh, make the Knicks a sustainable winner for some time. Okay. There you have it. He said a lot and absolutely nothing all at the same time. Because in the end, he want to make the team better. That fit into the culture. Okay. That's what every coach wants. Every GM wants. We shall see. Let's go to the phone. It's James, you're live with Stephen A. Talk to me. Hi, Steve. I was calling in reference to uh, L.A. being a good spot for Zion. Okay. But I was, I was thinking if L.A. doesn't get Zion, would not they be better off going after Julius Randle, who looks like a Zion, but not as big? Well, no, it's not the same. But you're right. You know, lefty, not necessarily ambidextrous. Uh, Julius Randle is vastly underrated, gives you a lot of energy, could have helped the Lakers immensely. No way in hell they should have lost him for $9 million. Uh, but that remains to be seen. Um, I, I think that he's stuck in New Orleans now. He's penciled in there. Um, it's one of those situations where the Lakers should not have let him go. They shouldn't have lost him. But he's gone, and I don't see him coming back, at least for this upcoming season. But then again, you never know. You never know. Appreciate the call, James. Thank you so much. Uh, let's go to Mario. You're live with Stephen A. What's up, Mario? Hey, Stephen. Thanks for having me here on the show. I just wanted to see if we could talk about how in the Rockets and Warriors series, in games one and game two, the number one controversy was, uh, and what became the Rockets' sixth man, was the refs. Okay. It was the refs. Everyone was talking about the refs. Mm -hmm. And once that became a non-factor, it was skill versus skill. There was no more complaining about what got called, what didn't got, get called. It was who could step up and who didn't step up. Mm -hmm. And that's when the Warriors prevailed. Well, you could say that, but here's the, here's the issue. And again, this is to me why CP3 and James Harden ain't going to live this down, even though I think that Mike D'Antoni deserves a strong level of culpability. And I don't view James Harden as some choker the way people have described him. He's not Steph Curry, and he definitely showed that. But I'm not going to call him a choker. What I will tell you is this. Here's what the ultimate indictment against Chris Paul and James Harden. All year long, we heard folks talking about how the Rockets would have won the championship if CP3 did not get hurt in game five last year. Well, a year later, you're healthy. James Harden is healthy. And Kevin Durant is down. And the bench is vastly depleted. Sean Livingston ain't what he used to be. Andre Iguodala isn't what he used to be. Andrew Bogut just came from down under. Lucky to get any minutes. Boogie Cousins is out with an Achilles. And you have an opportunity to put your foot on their necks. You're down 0-2. You tied up 2-2 two, 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 with Kevin Durant on the floor. Game 5 comes up. You're down 20. You come back and take the lead in Game 5 with Kevin Durant on the floor. But only when Kevin Durant goes down do y'all have no answer. Now, what kind of sense does that make? One of the prolific scorers this game has ever seen, an absolute superstar, widely considered to be the best basketball player on the planet as we speak right now, goes down, averaging 33 a game in the series, goes down. And suddenly y'all don't know how to play and beat them. It's inexcusable. It's inexcusable. You can't get around that. So the point that I'm trying to make to you is that you could say it was just skill, but I'm talking to you about coaching and about teamwork because when Kevin Durant was on the floor, they were giving it to the Golden State Warriors. 
And it was a nip and tuck series. It was only when he went down that they had no answer. Now, what type of sense does that make? Appreciate the call, Mario. Take care. Bobby, you're live with Stephen A. What's up? What's up, Stephen A.? How you doing, man? I'm all right. Talk to me. Oh, good. Listen, Stephen A., a couple questions for you, my brother. Listen, um, every, now everybody talking about all the teams in the NBA playoffs, but to me, my personal opinion, you know, I, I'm a list. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm a Golden State Warrior fan. I, I love the Warriors, heart and soul. But listen, but, but the scariest team in the NBA playoffs to me right now is the Portland Trailblazers. I'm telling you, you, everybody talking about everybody else, but everybody better watch Portland. The reason why is because of this, is because they have two guards. I like to call Batman and Robin. Uh, I, I call Damian Little and C.J. McCollum. They are the Batman and Robin of the playoffs because if Dame don't get you, C.J. going to get you, okay? They, they, listen, they, it, it, it was explained it, it, it was explained in the last series that they played in. Okay, because listen, if my boys don't get their stuff together, I think uh, it's going to be a new NBA champion crown this year. Well, okay? let me tell. You, well, let me say this to you: it might be a new crown, a champion crown, anyway, and it might be the Milwaukee Bucks. I think right now they're the biggest threat. But I will tell you this: I love what I saw from CJ McCollum. It was spectacular, and 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 Damian didn't have the greatest game. We get it, and CJ McCollum picked up the slack. And Damian and those boys ain't finished. They got a lot of heart, and they can ball. Here's my issue. Jamal Murray shot four of 18. They shot two of 19 from three-point range and missed their last 17 three-pointers. Do you really think that's going to happen to the Golden State Warriors? Man, listen, let me tell you something, Stephen A. <laughs> but listen, P Portland is not good. They're scary good. Sir, sir, okay? sir, with all due respect, that doesn't answer my question. I asked you a direct question. Do you think that they, I know Portland's scary good. I know this special. Matter of fact, if Nurkic were healthy, or even Enos Cancer, Enos Cancer wasn't playing with a separated left shoulder, I'd give them even more of a chance. But I'm asking you a simple question. Do you believe that the Golden State Warriors are going to miss 17 three-point shots in a row? <laughs> no. Okay. Because you got to remember, that's what happened to Denver. That's what happened. They had open shots, man. Now, Portland deserves all the credit in the world. But I'm not talking about open shots from scrubs. I mean, they were moving the basketball. You had guys like Gary Harris and Jamal Murray and Will Barton who can hit threes. They were open and just missing. They got tight. It was a game seven. They didn't get it done. Right. So let me ask you a question. They were tight. You know how young they are? <laughs> so what, what you, you think Steph Curry going to get tight? You think Clay Thompson going to get tight? You think Andre Iguodala going to get tight? Now, I understand if you're telling me they just could be better and they could be go to state because of that. But I'm saying to you, Denver was assisted or Portland was assisted by the youth and the anxiety of a young Port a Denver Nuggets squad. That's not the Golden State Warriors issue. Exactly. exactly. So what I'm trying to tell you is that you might be counting on them for the wrong reasons. Okay. Let me okay. ask you this well, question. Let me ask you this question. Do you think Portland will win, even with McCullum playing the way that he played? Do you think Portland will win if 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 if, if Dame shot three for seventeen again? Oh, oh no, absolutely so not. So what I'm saying to you is Portland has to play an elite series because they're going up against the champions. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Remember that. And, and, and I think and, and, and I think I think the series is going to go the whole seven. I think it'll go six if Durant comes comes back. I think it'll go seven if he doesn't. Appreciate the call, bro. Thank you so much. 888 say ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. Back with your calls to close out the show in a minute. By the way, people, I'm here to tell you about Zelle. A quick and easy way to send and receive money right from your banking app. Not sure what to get someone for their birthday, graduation, or housewarming? How about send them some money with Zelle? A truly one-size-fits-all present so they can buy whatever they want. The money goes directly into their bank account, typically within minutes if they're already enrolled, with Zelle so they don't have to wait long to spend it on a perfect gift for themselves. Look for Zelle in your banking app or get more info at ZellePay.com. Terms and conditions. Plus game five in most people's eyes.
That was your opportunity. You needed to put your foot on the gas. What's Mike D'Antoni doing during the timeout? All right, guys, you just got to make shots. You just got to hell you mean we just got to make shots. What Mike D'Antoni should have been saying is Stephen A. Smith would have coached the Houston Rockets, and I'm not qualified. I'm not qualified. Now, I know I'd be a hell of a basketball or a president of basketball operations. I have no doubt I would, I would kick tail with that job. But in terms of, because I know who to hire, and I know how to evaluate talent, and I know softies and scrubs when I see them, and they wouldn't be a part of my team. Let me be clear. And yes, unpopular to say, against the rules of today's NBA, I would absolutely positively have a goon on my roster. One goon, just one. I need somebody that's willing to beat teammates up in practice if they slack off. I need somebody that's willing to hurt somebody during games to remind you this is business. This is serious. But getting back to D'Antoni. D'Antoni's in a, in, a, in a timeout. Just got to make shots, guys. We just, just got to do our thing. Make shots. What? You supposed to be like this. Kevin Durant's out. Kevin Durant's down. This is our opportunity to put our foot on their neck and grind them into the ground. That's what he was supposed to do. That's what he was supposed to do. That's what CP3 was supposed to do. I don't understand this. I don't understand y'all. We got, I mean, I'm trying to tell you right now, the number one sponsor with some of these fans and some of these people in the NBA should be Cottonelle Tissue, soft as putty. That's the number one sponsor that should be in the NBA with some of the stuff that's going on here. You got Kevin Durant down and out? That's your time to put your foot on your neck and stomp them. And instead, Steph Curry goes off. Klay Thompson hits a three. Draymond Green hits a pivotal three from the left wing. And they were the Rough Riders. They were the dogs after Kevin Durant went out. Oh, CP3 and Jay Charlie got to make up for this. They got to make up for this. I know friends and family members of both. They know where I stand. Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance. Guests on the Stephen A. Smith Show appear via the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line. And you can always get in touch with the show through the 1-800-Flowers Twitter feed. Now, on demand in the Stephen A. Smith Podcast, brought to you by Capital One. Capital One is reimagining banking, offering accounts with no fees or minimums that can be opened in five minutes. Capital One, hey, hey. What's in your wallet? Capital One and a member FDIC. Back to the phones we go before we get on out of here. Oh, by the way, Joel and B, JJ Reddick and others have all given strong endorsements to Brett Brown for Brett Brown to remain as head coach for the Philadelphia 76ers. I have no problem with it. I like Brett Brown. Um, there are things that he could do better from time to time. There's no doubt about it, but he's a good man. I think he's a good coach. I don't mind him staying on board. I will say this though. If you're the players and you're going to support him so much, why is he home right now? When, when Joel Embiid says, put it on me, or Ben Simmons, or J.J. Reddick, not that they said that, but Joel Embiid said that, the point is, is that if you do what you're supposed to do with the talent that you have, maybe you're playing in the Eastern Conference Finals. So I would hope that if I'm Elton Brand and the Sixers, you know what I'm inclined to do? All right, what y'all telling me? Y'all going to go all out to do what you need to do so this man can keep his job? Okay, I'll keep him one more year. Let's see what he's got. I don't know if the Sixers are going to do that, though. It's a question mark. Because remember, the owner, Josh Harris, said his expectation at the beginning of the playoffs, said the expectation was a berth in the Eastern Conference Finals. Anything less would be unacceptable. Well, they didn't make it, albeit by a couple of bounces in the, as time expired by Kawhi Leonard to deliver the goods. Go figure. Let's go back to the phones real, real quick. Let's go to... um. <clears throat> Mike, you're live with Stephen A. Real quick, Mike, go. Hey, Stephen A. Thanks for carrying me over from hour one. I appreciate that. Go ahead, man. Um, I told you to hurry up. We only got a minute. <laughs> yeah. I told you that. Well, I got to ride with Jalen Brown with Jalen Rose. Uh, I I care about John Beeline. Go blue, hail to the victors. No, what I was saying um, about John Beeline is this: announce the news. He's going to the Cavs. But what is it about the Cavs that's newsworthy? Not about John Beeline. What is it about the Cavs that's newsworthy? 
other than reporting the news that he's the head coach. What else do we need to know? But um, when we're, we were talking about the Lakers job and, and the LeBron circus that uh, has been going on there. Um, I mean, would you really want to take that coaching job and then on Sunday night you have to watch LeBron and his buddies on their cool TV This is show? not that. Stop, stop, stop. This is not LeBron and Clutch Sports. This is the Lakers with Palenka and Linda Rambis and Kurt Rambis. Clutch Sports don't have anything to do with that. This is not LeBron James and Clutch Sports. This is on the Lakers. Magic Johnson walking away wasn't because of Clutch Sports. It was because of the Lakers. It's not right to point the finger at Clutch Sports on this one. Not on this one. I got to come to their defense there. It's not their fault. And Vogel knew exactly what he was doing and taking his job, knowing it's going to be Jason Kidd's within two years. But he's getting $5 million per year. I think he'll get over it. Holla at y'all in 22 hours. Peace and love. Hey, what's up? It's Will Kane coming up right after Stephen A. Smith.